All right, we're finally live. And uh, we had we started a while ago, messed things up, had to leave everything, start all over. But, you know, that's the way it is with Christianity. When things fall apart, what do you do? You get back up and go again. Amen. So we are going to be talking about the way of Cain. And uh, I was asking everybody in our congregation earlier, and by the way, you visit our website at lyitl.org. And uh, all of our video sermons are uploaded there every week. So if you can't make it here in person, make sure you log in on live or follow up with that. But the way of Cain, Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 13, that we'll be reading today. But why did God uh, not accept Cain's offering? And uh, uh, why did he accept his brother Abel's offering? And, what, and how is that relating to Christianity today? All right, we're going to look at that. So the book of Genesis is, uh, that stands for beginning. So it's the, it's the book of beginnings. And in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now circle that word K-N-E-W, and she conceived. So there's no doubt in my mind or your mind that they, you know, husband and wife, and they got together and she became pregnant, right? So it was a sexual encounter with his wife, but it was more than that. And we're going to talk about that today. It wasn't just that Adam had, uh, you know, a marital relationship with his wife. It was deeper than that. And I'll tell you about that today. All right. And so Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, uh, circle the word Cain. Now, this is important. Okay. Think about this. The very first baby ever born. Cain. Isn't that amazing? Now, it blows your mind, doesn't it? So he begins out with a. Uh, the family of God, and look how he turned out at the end. So why did God, uh, you know, uh, not accept his offering? And why, why, even though Cain brought the what, the uh, the vegetables and, and the and the corn and all that, and he brought the best. Well, his brother brought a, a blood sacrifice, but that's not the reason why God accepted uh, Abel and everything. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper today. So why did God accept? Abel's offering, and of course, not Cain's, all right? So he goes on to say, uh, uh, verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. Now let me stop there, okay? Uh, sometimes, hi, Ann, good to see you, love you, all right? And uh, all the way from Lubbock, Texas, everybody say hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we are talking about the way of Cain, and notice here it says, as she, she again bear his brother Abel. Now here is some of the doctrinal questions. Did she uh, have twins? Because she bared one and bared another. Okay? Or is it possible that she had one and then nine months later had another one? Well, we really don't know, but that's just food for thought, isn't it? Right? And Catherine James, good to see you. We're in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 13, the way of Cain. And so he says, and, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought uh, of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. See, they were trained about, you know, the physical part of what you're supposed to do. But God's looking for the spiritual part of the heart. So he says in verse 4, and Abel, he uh, also brought of what? the firstlings of the, of the uh, flock and in the fat thereof. And, and notice, in the fat thereof. So in other words, he spent a lot of time preparing to, to bring that offering to God. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth or angry or mad, frustrated, and his countenance fell, underlying that. Anytime you, you're involved with a sinful action, uh, our countless changes. So verse number six, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? And he says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be a, 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 accepted. I'm going to read that again. Verse seven, if thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, uh, sin lieth at the door. And unto uh, uh, thee, shall be the what the desire and shall uh, rule over him so 
Uh, verse 8, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to, to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I uh, my brother's keeper? Now, of course, he was used to being a shepherd. And so he said, it was, what, what are you doing? It's not my responsibility, God. It was your responsibility, right? And so he's kind of being sarcastic with God. And, and he said, what hast thou uh, 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 done? The voice of thy brother's uh, uh, blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou uh, cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, let me stop there. So how did he kill his brother? Well, they were taught how to offer a blood sacrifice. So a lot of scholars believe, and those, uh, you know, that really theologians get in there, they, were, they probably cut his brother's throat and let him drain out. I know it sounds gross, but that's probably what happened because he says his blood was where? In the ground. Just some things for you to think about. And he says, uh, and now thou art cursed from the earth, uh, which has opened her mouth to re uh, receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. So the earth received his blood. It soaked up into the earth. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not, uh, this outside verse 12, right? The word curse. Uh, when thou tillest the ground, it, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. And a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be uh, in the earth. And then our last verse, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And I want to go back in a little bit later on possibly tonight's sermon. Uh, why, verse 14, there's so much information there that the average reader today in the local church doesn't get. So the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And Genesis records the beginnings of the universe. It records the beginnings of the world, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of the animal life and the plant life and human life, along with many other important things. That's why it's called the book of beginnings, right? So that's why we're in Genesis. And so uh, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, many F-I-R-S-T, first things appear. Uh, the, the first man, the first woman, the first commandment from God, the first marriage, uh, the first home, the first sin, and the first death, the first sacrifice, and the first worship, the first murder, and the first curse, and the list goes on and on. So wow, it's kind of an exciting book to read in the book of Genesis, right? So in this passage, the Lord gives us a glimpse into the world's first family, Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve are the focus of the verses that are before us today. So it, uh, we find here, Lupi, that while there are a great many truths, I believe, to be expounded upon in these passages, one stands higher than the other, at least for me. The life of Cain, I see a portrait of every lost sinner who's ever lived. We're going to tell you, show you how that Cain and who he was, and, what, and when, they were all taught to bring an offering to God, all right? And, uh, but why was his rejected? Was it because it wasn't the best? Well, it was the best. It was the best a crop could be. And then, of course, we know that Abel brought, uh, uh, you know, a, a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. But it wasn't about the offerings. It was not about the offerings at all. All right. So what was it about? Why did God reject Cain and take Abel? All right. So let's go a little farther. We'll find out. So while there are, I believe, many truths today in the passages, I believe that this one about Cain is a portrait, like I said, of every non-believer today. And there's a lot of people going to church that uh, all around the world that they'll attend church, but they don't have never put their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, non-believers, right? So Cain is the, uh, uh, the prototype of every sinner who would follow him in this world. He says, well, I want you to look at Cain. He says in Proverbs 16, 25, he says, uh, which says, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So Cain thought he was doing the right thing. He was taught by his mom and dad how to bring an offering to God, and he did that. But there was something missing in Cain's life. What was that? Let's find out. 
So that verse describes the life of Cain perfectly. It also describes the lives of many who live uh, uh, not by faith, but they're walking after the flesh. In fact, Jude 11 says uh, that the lifestyle was what? The way of Cain. So the passage that we'll study reveals the characteristics, I believe, today of those who refuse to live a life according to God's word and God's will. And there's a reason why they don't. And I'll talk about that today. So when you hear these characteristics and everything, uh, I'd like for you to uh, ask and examine your own heart. See if we more or less line up with the life of Cain or the life of Abel. And you'll see that as we go through this. So if you see some of these characteristics that we talk about in your life, it might indicate to you that, hey, you might need to get a real salvation that comes from God, right? And if you, I would encourage you to believe in the gospel and, and to look to Jesus Christ for your salvation. That I just gave you a key right there, uh, Lady Karen, in our teach today. So if you're saved and you see these characteristics in those around you, I challenge you to lift them up in prayer and determine in your own heart once and for all that, that, that you will give the gospel of grace to everyone. What does it mean? You tell them about Jesus Christ, right? So let's get this thing going this morning. So let's explore the way of Cain just for a few moments. And uh, let me uh, point out from this text the characteristics of those who are walking the same path. So number one, verses one through five, it's characterized by, write this down, an unbelieving heart. The chapter begins with a picture of a great hope. After Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they, they were cast out of that beautiful garden by the Lord. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 3, verses three, uh, 23 through 24. So, and what did God do? Victoria, he placed an angel, uh, you know, a high archangel at, at, with a flaming sword at the entrance of the garden of to prevent Adam and Eve from, from ever re-entering the garden and from eating the, the tree of life, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. But Adam and Eve were driven, loopy, out of the garden of Eden, and they were forced to seek a meager existence by working the ground uh, uh, for their food. So what used to come easy to them, now they've got to work hard for, all right? So their lives, which had been so perfect before they sinned, it changed in every way. All right, so what's the point? You know, when you and I, even as, as the children of God, we, we're going to live for God, we're going to serve God, we're going to believe in the things of God, but once we let sin come in our life, he says, we're going to find something that's going to die in our life, okay? So their lives revolve around a hard work uh, and, and drudgery and, and, and boundless regret. How many today, if you look back over your life, there's still some things you regret, Right? But uh, here we, we find that, that their lives have been so perfect before they sinned, but once they sinned, now they've been casted out of God's presence, but not out of God's existence. I'll talk to you more about that. So the, the days of walking with the Lord, uh, Lady Karen in a cool garden, they're over. And so they were consigned to a life of pain, toil, eventually death, and all hope is gone. So Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. So suddenly there was hope. Suddenly the face of a certain death, uh, there was a wonder of a new life that God was going to take and allow them to have some hope in their life, right? So here, he said, in the face of certain death, there was the wonder of new life. So the hope of a new beginning and the promise of a better tomorrow. So they thought, wow, we got a man from the Lord. Right? So while I'm hearing this verse, let me say this. The Bible says Adam, K-N-E-W, his wife. So the word new means to fully, uh, to know fully and to know by experience. All right? So the word new is, is, uh, is referring to, or an ephesism, of, of you know, a sexual intercourse. We know that. But Adam and Eve came together in a physical union. But the word expresses something a lot deeper than that. In fact, the word uh, 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 know suggests for a deeper connection between a man and woman is that, it, that what, what was impossible just from a casual get-together, uh, what we call, I'll call it the honeymoon, all right? Uh, so, but it was more than that. We live in a culture today where we've cheapened, uh, you know, even, even the subject of sex, right? So most people in our culture today believe they can engage in casual sex 
and still experience long-term satisfaction in their relationships. But we know that that's wrong, and we've seen it before. People engaged in that particular activity without understanding the deeper meaning behind what you're doing. Okay? That's what I want you to get from this. It's not, it wasn't about just going out and knowing somebody in a sexual way, but to really K-N-O-W somebody. All right? So there's more to human sexual experience than just a mere physical pleasure. So here's it. The view of sex that dominates our society has become warped, and it distorts God's intention in the gift of sex to humanity, all right? So when the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, it refers not just to a physical union, but to a, a commitment to know a, a, a person in all of their dimensions, all right? A commitment to study them and to learn everything there is about them. So, he's, so in other words, he had been around his wife, but this was more than just a, a physical encounter. He really took the time to begin to try to know that person. And, you know, that's lessons I've had to learn in my life. How about you guys? You know, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to, to really get the K-N-O-W somebody, you know, to know everything about them. But it refers to a union that's, that's, uh, uh, that is uh, 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 not only flesh, but heart and goal and one life. Let me say it again. It refers to a union. When he, K-N-E-W, knew his wife, it refers to a union that is not only one flesh, but, one, but it's one flesh, one heart, one goal, and one life put together to bring glory to Almighty God. So if people brought that understanding into their physical relationships, their premarital sex and adultery, the Bible calls it, would cease to be a problem uh, that we have in the world. But what is that? So a new life has begun. And this is where it gets really, really interesting, all right? So a new life has begun, and uh, Eve, like billions of her daughters uh, to follow, uh, must have been excited about the baby growing in her womb. I can imagine her calling Adam over to feel the baby kick, you know, against her belly. I can see her, him placing his ear uh, to her belly and listening to the tiny heartbeat on the inside. And it was a time of new possibilities, renewed hope and excitement of expectation. Then one day the wait was over and Eve gave birth to the first baby born into the world. Eve was the first woman to experience the pains of childbirth. And on the heels of that experience, she was the first to what? Experience the joy of holding a baby in her arms, a newborn baby. Have you ever thought about that? It's amazing, right? So Eve named the baby Cain, C-A-I-N, which means I have gotten, okay? Eve gives God the glory for a new baby. She says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she saw his birth as a time of divine blessings in her life for her, her family, and in the world. And then came another baby whom they named Abel. His name means breath or vapor or perishable. So the name would, would prove prophetic. We know that as their second son uh, would perish like a breath exhaled in the air. So in other words, his name was prophesied. The prophecy behind it was is that he wouldn't be here for long, okay? So once again, uh, we find breath or vapor. So who would have thought that Abel would have died? He was a young man. And so these boys have, maybe they were twins. If so, verse 2 refers to Abel's birth with no mention of a second conception. Isn't that amazing? Where they were or was doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that the sadness of Adam and Eve uh, 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 over their sin and over their lost fellowship with the Lord is somewhat how it migrated to their children. Did y'all get that? How the, the, you know, the journey of faith that you and I take is often migrated to our children or the journey of lack of faith, all right? So those babies brought hope into the world and they must have seemed uh, at that one time so hopeless, now they got hope. Babies possess that power. You know, don't they? They often bring joy and they bring laughter and, 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 and crying as a crying creature of God, you know, at the weird hours of the night. 
But these two boys grew up together in the same home. They had the same parents. They received the same instructions. They saw the same things. They shared the same experiences. But as they grew, their differences began to emerge. So when it came to, uh, to, uh, to choose a job, they both chose an honorable vo vocation. Uh, Cain followed his father's footsteps and became a farmer. Abel became a shepherd. Both vocations were important and they helped to sustain the family. But at some point, probably as they reached young adulthood, uh, we find here that those men came before the Lord to worship. So Adam and Eve explained to them what it was like to walk in the garden and how to present an offering to God. It had to be your very best. But I'm sure they had been trained by Adam and Eve, uh, which is their parents, as how they were to what? To approach God. Did you get that? How they were to approach God. Can you imagine what kind of evangelist Adam and Eve probably turned out to be? Can you imagine that? I'm sure that, that, uh, 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 you know, that they knew what it was to walk with God. They knew what it was to lose that sweet fellowship. They were then when God confronted them over their sin and, and killed an animal, a, a, a sinless animal, in other words, to provide a covering for their nakedness in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. I can imagine they shared that same information with their sons. And I wonder how many times Adam took them uh, 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 and took them on their knees and told them about God and how, how, how that God was supposed to be approached and how God was supposed to be worshipped, okay? And I wonder how many times Eve warned them to listen to the Lord and not to the devil. That was where her sin fault came in, right? So in verses 3 and 4, Cain and Abel came before God to make an offering, right? The Bible says in verse 4, look, that the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Then in verse 5, but unto Cain his offering, he had not respect. Uh, uh, respect, why? Because the word respect means to what? To look upon something with approval. So why did God say no to Cain and yes to Abel? Uh, uh, I've heard all kinds of theories on this, of, of how the, the offerings were to be accepted and or rejected, and yet God did not accept Abel's offering over Cain's simply because Abel was a blood sacrifice. You say, well, yes, because he, he sacrificed an animal. That had nothing to do with why God accepted Abel's offering. God did not reject Cain's sacrifice simply because it was not an animal sacrifice. Then what was it that caused God Luby to reject Cain's sacrifice. What was it, Victoria, that caused God to accept Abel's uh, uh, sacrifice? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God killed an innocent animal to provide a covering for their nakedness. Now, I want you to get that. And yet, in both Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God told Israel to offer grain and food as an offering to thank him for the blessings and to acknowledge him as a source of their provisions. And it's in fact the fruit of the field, that's a phrase that was used in the Bible, was therefore an offering that was accepted by God. So it, it wasn't the offering that God was rejecting of Cain. It wasn't really the offering that God accepted Abel. There was something about the boys themselves, all right? And so what was that? So in the Garden of Eden, uh, God had established a pattern for approaching God, and that pattern's never changed, okay? So the ultimate sacrifice was made when Jesus Christ came in the world, gave his life for the sinners of the cross, shedding his perfect sinless blood to redeem the law, satisfying the demands of God over sin, and wash uh, the sinner clean. You can read about that in First Peter. Let's read that. First Peter. Chapter 1, verse 18 through 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Can y'all see Adam talking to, to uh, Cain and Abel out of this verse? Can you see that? He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your father, verse 19, but with precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We also go and look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness 
and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So from Genesis to Revelation, God's method for cleansing sin has always remained the same. It, it takes the blood of an innocent sacrifice to cleanse the sinner from his sin. So Hebrews 9.22 Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. So you see in Eden, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21, uh, you see this in Eden. Uh, you see this in Egypt when the blood of the Lamb was to be protecting the people of Israel from even the death angel. In, in Exodus chapter 12, Lady Karen, verses 1 through 13. And yet you see throughout the, the history of this that uh, uh, even the history of worship in Egypt when the high priest on the day of atonement entered into the holy of holies and the blood of the sanctuary uh, uh, atoning sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 16 through 28. So if just because you walked in with some blood is that going to save you? No. Uh, so once again Everything we've looked at talks about Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God was judged in the place of sinners. You can read about that. I'm not going to read it for time's sake. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. But while that must be a part of what is happening in our text today, we find here that it ultimately not only does it talk about uh, Jesus Christ, but look at verse 4. And Abel... He also brought the firstling of the flock and the fat thereof. So the word firstling suggests the best, okay? And the phrase of the fat thereof speaks of what? The preparation. Did you get that? The preparation that was needed in order to, to offer the offering to God. And so Abel carefully selected the best animal he had. He took time to prepare the sacrifice. He brought it before the Lord and he offered it what? Here's the key, Loopy, by faith. See, Cain offered an offering to the Lord, but it wasn't by faith. And so Abel offered an offering to the Lord, but he did it by faith, all right? It appears that Abel went out of his way to offer a sacrifice that was very well pleasing to God. So in Genesis 3.21, God set the pattern for sacrifice. Blood was required. In Genesis 3.15, God promised that one day a Savior would come. And that uh, through His blood, and you believing in God, and, and, and literally J God, His blood was shed for you. It's by faith that we are accepted of God. So what was the one thing that Abel had that Cain didn't? Faith. Abel had faith in God. Cain just done something of the flesh. He said, okay, I'll bring it to God. So what, what was wrong with that picture? So the writer of Hebrews said this about uh, Abel's sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Lady Karen, verse 4. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was what? Righteous, but testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. All right? So once again, it didn't say anything about Cain's faith. He just, uh, Luke, he just decided to go out. His dad shot Adam, showed him how to get the best of the best, clean it up, take it before God. So it's not about the offering. It was about the faith that the offering represented. And Cain did not have that faith. He did not have that faith. Abel, Abel, uh, Abel had faith. All right? So why is that important? Well, make sure you jot it down, 11, uh, Hebrews 11, 4. For by faith, Abel offered unto God. Did you get that? So Abel's sacrifice, he was saying, I believe the Lord, and I believe he's coming. I believe, you know, I mean, his heart became tender. Uh, his sacrifice revealed the condition of his heart. He loved God, and he honored God's word. He believed in God's promise of a Savior. And he became humble. But, then, but the main thing is, he, he had faith faith in God. He put his faith in God. So in according to verse 5, God accepted Abel's and his offering uh, in 1 John 3, 12 says that works were righteous. So what he did by offering that, he offered it by a real faith in God. And that's why God accepted it, all right? It wasn't about 
uh, was it the best calf or was it a brown one or a white one? But these were all animals that were sinless, you know, and, and, and in other words. And yet he offered by a blood sacrifice. But if you go back and read Hebrews, that all the blood sacrificing, that does not impress God. It was the blood of his son that he accepted, right, for paying all sin. And so uh, according to verse 5, God accepted Abel and his offering. And uh, so Abel's faith in God translated to God accepting Abel and to, to God declaring righteousness over Abel, okay? So Cain, on the other hand, uh, is said to have brought the fruit of the ground. That's all he did. There's no evidence of faith in the promises of God. There's no evidence of preparation. Cain's offering said, I know what you said, uh, but, but here it is. Uh, I'll give it to you, God. You take it or leave it. Cain's offering was an act of false worship. Oh, my, did you get it now? False worship. They said, my way, he said, my way will work just as well as your way. I don't need to take, have my heart tenderized before God. I don't need to really, I'm just doing it out of the flesh. You see? So he's offering false worship. And, and look, I'm afraid to say that a lot of people around the world today, they'll go to a church, they'll hear the singing, and they'll hear the preaching, they'll take their notes, but no time in church, they take time out to worship God. You know, the biggest part of, our, of any church should be the altar call at the end where people come not, not just to get saved and not just to get right, but just to come and worship God on bended knee. I, I can't see Cain getting on his knees before God with his hands up saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, right? But Abel went to God with that type of heart. I am a sinner, and I know there's a Savior coming. And he offered that sacrifice in view of the Lord Jesus Christ even though he didn't know Jesus' name, right? So, Abel, there's an acknowledgement of sin and his need of a Savior. Cain, there is neither, all right? So, Cain neither acknowledged that he was a sinner or he needed a Savior. So, what happened? There is a warning here that needs to go out. Now, I'm going to give you that warning because time's going out. Facebook only gives us so much time, right? Uh, so, what is the warning? Here it is. God will not accept our religion. God will not accept our works. He will not accept anything that we can do as an attempt to save ourselves. And that's, we know about that, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, you know. And, and so the only thing God will accept is what he has already provided. He will accept nothing but what? Faith. That's why he was known as a faith chapter, right? Uh, by faith. Uh, it, it said, and, and the atoning sacrifice of the, even the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but what? By me. He didn't say by Pastor Rick. He didn't say by the name on the church. You see? So we find in John 16, 31, Jesus answered and said, Do ye now what? Believe. Isn't that something? So Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We've heard that before a hundred thousand times probably from this pulpit up here. But Cain revealed his lost condition by his unbelieving heart. He refused to come God's way. All right. In short, he rejected the gospel uh, of grace, and, and, uh, and so God rejected him. He rejected what his sacrifice was supposed to be symbolic of. He, he had no care about it. In fact, he got very sarcastic with God. So the question is, what does your heart say about you? Uh, you say, well, you know, I, I believe the gospel. Well, does your life reflect that? So once again, are you trusting Jesus? Or are you trusting in something else? He did as the only hope. You, and, and you say, well, what, where do you put your salvation I put my salvation in the promise that Jesus gave. That whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved, all right? So my only hope is Jesus. So think about this. Good works, religious deeds, a good life, church membership, baptism, communion. None of these will ever save you. 
Matthew 7, 21, we're getting close to the end. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, listen to what Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will? That you trust God by faith. And the blood that was shed by his son, the innocent, for you and I. Verse 22, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them. To me, this is the scariest verse in the entire Bible. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So Luby is saying, you, 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 you didn't know how to approach God. You approach God by faith. Not by you bringing some corn. or Not because you brought a calf. and sacrifice. It's by faith that we do it. And uh, so God's plan is simple as I'm closing this down. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, I hope you'll turn there. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. Romans 10, 9. So we talked about the unbelieving heart. We talked about uh, the, uh, uh, the unrepentant heart. And as soon as Cain realized that his offering had been rejected by God, the Bible says his countenance fell. It was no longer fun doing this. You see, that means that the whole demeanor changed. He could not understand why God would accept Abel's offering and reject his. Yet the, God knows what is in Cain's heart. And God knows what's in Abel's heart. In fact, uh, in verses 6 and 7 of our text today, God speaks to Cain and asks him why he's upset. The word wroth is used in verse 5 and 6, which means to burn with hot anger and jealousy. So God tells Cain in verse 7 that, uh, that if he did what was right, he would have been accepted too. I don't think God's telling Cain to, uh, to go get a, a better sacrifice. No, I think the Lord has called him to change his heart toward God. Oh, somebody say amen. You see, you don't get saved because you went to a church, got dunked, and said a few prayers. No, you get saved because you realize you're a sinner and that God's the Savior. And he sent the redemption through his son who shed his blood so you and I can have everlasting life. Jesus, the sinless one who knew no sin for us, right? So God tells Cain in verse 7, that if he had just done it right, if you'd have brought your offering by faith, you'd have been accepted. Now then, this is really exciting to me. I'm going to finish up some of this here to, uh, tonight. But I want you, to, let's go ahead and read what we left off. In Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. So here's the deal. Does God still love Cain? Yes, he does. Why? He says, verse 14, Behold, that thou hast driven me out this day from the, from the face of the earth, and from uh, uh, thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive in, and a vagabond upon the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that, comes, uh, 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 that findeth me uh, uh, shall slay me. He says, listen, I have nowhere to go. You see, let's face it, today we have nowhere to go but to Jesus Christ. But Cain wasn't putting his trust in the faith that God was going to send a Savior. All right? So, uh, once again, and he says in verse 15, And the Lord has said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the, listen, you know what God's doing? He's protecting him. You see, and the Lord uh, set a, a, a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out, in verse 16, from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod and the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and, con and, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And, and he says, and, a, and a built, built in a city that called the name of the city after the name of the son. And so Enoch, all right? And he says, and he made Enoch was born uh, uh, I read, and I read to get Miguel, and he talks about all the genealogies after that. So did God bless Cain with a family? Do you think Cain might have told him about God and what had happened to him? I'm telling you today, I know you've been through a lot. You've made as many, probably 
a few mistakes. I've made many, 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 many mistakes in my life. But the one thing I think is so important as my life closes down and your life is starting to close down is this. Do we have our faith in Jesus Christ? Are we asking him to like the thief on the cross? He says, nothing I can do. We're guilty. I'm, we're a sinner. And so, I started, it's good to see you. And so, once again, the way of Cain. Boy, what a powerful message this is coming from God. So God did not reject uh, uh, Cain's offering. It was that God rejected Cain because he had no faith in God. But yet he accepted Abel, not because of his offering, but because he had faith that God was going to, this was a, a type by the blood that would be shed, that God's going to send a Savior. So what are we doing here at the end? Like the thief on the cross, he said, I'm guilty. Lady Karen, I, I'm fixing to die. You know, and I'm fixing to go out to eternity. So he turns to Jesus and he shouts out, you know, would you remember me? And Jesus, in the midst of all, I can't even imagine the pain. Luby, they said he was so beaten, he looked like a beast. Not these pretty pictures you see. I wish there would be an artist that would paint it like it should be. You know? But it was horrible. Some people don't like watching the passion play because it's too realistic. Well, that's nothing compared to what Jesus went through. But he looked over at this man called Jesus. And by faith, he asked Jesus, would you remember me? And what did Jesus do? He turned and said what? Today, thou will be with me in paradise. Do you K-N-O-W, 1 John 5, 13? 1 John 5, 13 says you can know, K-N-O-W, that you have everlasting life as long as it's by faith in Jesus Christ. I pray if you don't know Christ as your Savior, humble your heart today and say, God, I'm a sinner. And I know you're the Savior. And I'm asking you to remember me. I want to spend eternity with you. And then God goes on a little bit later Loopy to tell us that when we get saved, God sends the Holy Spirit of God to lock it in. You can't get unsaved no matter if you tried. Just like you can't get saved no matter how hard you tried without the blood of Jesus. But once you're saved, you're locked in until the day we get to go home. What about you? Do you K-N-O-W enough now? Father, I pray if there be one listening today. Lord, they played the church thing, but they didn't know how to really approach God. You, Lord, we've learned we approach God with a humble heart, a heart that is burdened because we know that we're a sinner. And then we simply look to you as our Savior, and we ask you just to simply save us. And you said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But those verses before said, it tells us that we must believe that Jesus died for our sins, rose for our sins, and he's alive forevermore. So, Lord Jesus, here's my prayer. Lord, I'm asking you, I'm coming to you by faith. As we humble our heart, Lord, we're sinners. And we look to Jesus as our Savior. And we simply pray, Lord Jesus, like the thief on the cross, would you remember me too? Would you save me? And when your Holy Spirit comes into my life immediately to seal me, that, Lord, my countenance would change for the right reasons to worship God. That, Lord, that I would be accepted because I'm putting all my faith in you. So, Father, I pray for me one listen today. If they don't know you as Savior, today would be that day. They bow their head in, in need of a Savior, look to you, ask you to save them, and then, Lord, go to the Word of God and learn how much you love them. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Love you all.